Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Sanchez, and I have the honor of serving as the 25th Law Librarian of Congress. Welcome to the Library of Congress, and thank you for joining us tonight in celebration of the heritage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a milestone document which underpins all international human rights law and inspires us to continue to work to ensure that all people can gain freedom, equality, and dignity. Each year, the Law Library of Congress celebrates Human Rights Day by recognizing a critical social, economic, or cultural human rights issue. In previous years, the Law Library hosted a number of Human Rights Day events that highlighted various aspects of this topic, such as repatriating Native American cultural property and remains, human rights in Eastern Europe, Islamic law reform, and rights of refugees and internally displaced persons. Today, I am pleased to announce our topic this year. The year 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting women's constitutional right to vote. The passage marked the largest expansion of democracy in the history of our country. This historic centennial offers an unparalleled opportunity to commemorate a milestone of democracy and to explore its relevance to the issue of equal rights today. The Library of Congress has joined many institutions in Washington, D.C. and across the nation, marking the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. We are proud to host Shall Not Be Denied Women's Right Fight for the Vote exhibition. If you have not visited the exhibition yet, here in the Jefferson Building, you still can. The exhibit is open through September 2020. Today, more than 68 million women vote in elections thanks to the courageous suffragists who never gave up the fight for equality. But as we celebrate, we must also continue examining the challenges of democracy and equal rights that face us today. Tonight, we are going to hear and learn more about women's suffrage movement and how it impacts women's rights today. Please allow me to introduce our panel participants. Kareen McConaughey, she says she's like the other McConaughey, Associate Professor of Political Science at George Washington University and author, author of the Women's Suffrage Movement in, a, in America a reassessment, and Elaine Weiss, journalist and author of The Women's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote. And moderating today's panel is Colleen Shogan, Assistant Deputy Librarian of Library Collections and Services, and the library's representatives. She's also the Vice Chair of the Congressional Suffrage Centennial Commission. And now, let's get started. Ladies, you can be first. <laughs> okay, terrific. I think we're going to have a great conversation. I think so. Uh, this yeah. evening, I've really been looking forward to it. And we'll try to save a little bit of time at the end for questions. Uh, uh, so you'll get to quiz Elaine and Corrine as well. Uh, as Jane said, you know, women fought for the right to vote for over 70 years. And the 19th Amendment was finally enacted and added to the Constitution in 1920. Why did it take so long, and why did it happen when it did? Democracy is hard. <laughs> uh, right. Um, so why did it take so long? I think, you know, the the basic answer to that question is, is 
that changing the rules by which politicians uh, ha have to operate mm -hmm. is, is, is fundamentally difficult, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we can think about how hard it is to pass um, a standard policy reform, right? How, it, how hard it may be to change rights in the sense of new marriage rights, new property rights. That those sorts of policy changes don't change the basic calculations of, of how politicians do business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but expansions of voting rights do. Mm -hmm. um, and for women's suffrage in particular, there's this challenge of, so exactly what is the incentive? Right? Mm -hmm. Exactly what's the incentive for politicians to expand the vote to double the electorate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm when it's just not at all clear who would benefit from that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and while we got some rhetoric around, oh, well, women would, women would purify or elevate politics, um, it's quite difficult to find one politician, many politicians who were sure of that, or if they were, who liked that <laughs> idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, right? Um, but what they were, what they were dubious of was the idea that, that there would be a women's vote, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, so who was going to win, mm -hmm. um, right? And, and so creating the incentive to get politicians to change the fundamental rules of the game. Mm -hmm. it, it was the, a, a monumental political puzzle. I think to understand why it took so long also, besides all the very uh, valid reasons uh, that you bring up. I think you have to understand the push for women's suffrage as not just a political movement. It's not asking just for a, po a political change. It's not um, about just an electoral law change or a constitutional amendment. It is signaling, pushing, advocating for a, ch a cultural change a change in the perception and in the, the, the rights and the role of women in society. Mm -hmm. So even taken, e even if politicians thought this was a super duper idea <laughs> and they were all mm -hmm. going to benefit mm -hmm. from it, um, it, mm -hmm. it again was such a large change in how the nation and how society at large was going to view women. So it's much more complicated than just a political change, um, which meant that the suffragists had to change hearts and minds, not just in the legislatures, not just in the Congress, but in the heartland. It, they had to change people's, men and women's, perception of what a woman could and should do in society. So when the movement begins, women are not supposed to uh, address a mixed crowd of people. They're not supposed to speak in public at all. But if they are, if they do, even in a church setting, they're not supposed to speak if men are present. That was considered promiscuous. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of what women should or shouldn't do had to be completely rethought. And that is a very slow process. And that's what the suffragists were chipping away at those uh, monumental walls that separated what a woman w wanted to do and what a woman was supposed to do. She was supposed to stay home. She was, and, and one of the, the biggest um, anti-suffrage arguments was that this was going to upset the American home. It was going to upset morality and society and women were going to abandon their children. So I think if we look at it in that dual sense of this is a very large po political change, um, and you know, if you look at it honestly, men are giving up half of their electoral power. What is, you know, why would they do that? Mm -hmm. But then you couple that with a much larger, even more difficult um, bill of goods to sell, which is women should be equal politically and socially. And that was, took even longer. 
Tell us a little bit about the two sides of, the, of this fight. So you have the suffragists and you have the opposition, the anti-suffragists. I think some people are surprised to learn mm -hmm. that there are prominent, well-educated women on both sides of this fight. So talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, when I discovered the anti-suffragists, <laughs> Uh, the women, I mean, there are, there are many anti-suffragists of all stripes. There are, but when we think of opposition to the idea of women uh, voting, I guess we think, and I, I was, you know, I, I fully admit I thought this too, men opposed it because you could kind of understand men thought this was presumptuous, it was cutting their own power, it was not their uh, idea of what a woman should be, you know, a woman shouldn't have opinions, she shouldn't speak her mind, all these, all these ideas. What we don't think of is that women opposed women's suffrage and organized to oppose it and wrote, had their own publications opposing it and campaigned opposing it. And I think that was one of the most surprising things I found in my research and in some ways fascinating. Who were these women? Why did they do this? And as you said, uh, Colleen, there were uh, some of them were very well educated. Uh, th you know, these were not um, you know women who'd never thought about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are, are wealthy. Uh, you know, there's wealthy women on both sides. Wealthy women funded the suffrage movement, but they also some did oppose it. Um, and you say, well, why would you oppose your sisters having the vote? And the answer for, for that strata of women was everything's fine. Status quo's just great for me. Uh, I don't need the vote because my uncle or my father or my husband or my brother is the bank president, is the congressman, um, you know, is the president. So why would I, why do I need to vote? I get my opinion across uh, at the dinner table. So there's that part. The, the, that a group of women. Um, then there's women who um, honestly believe uh, they're, that this is going, the idea of women's suffrage is so frightening, it will, again, disrupt the American home, it will undercut morality, uh, women will be wanton in the streets if they're allowed to vote, and there are these wonderful anti-suffrage uh, broadsides that show you know, women abandoning their families, first of all, to, to um, be able to, uh, to campaign for the vote. So it shows them, you know, marching off and daddy's holding the screaming babies. Mm -hmm. And then it shows, another one shows election day and a very well-dressed woman, again, putting on her gloves and daddy is holding the screaming babies. So it's this idea that your entire personal world will be disrupted. Uh, if you allow women to vote. Mm -hmm. Then there's others who have particular interests in stopping uh, women's suffrage. And some of them, especially in the southern states, but not, not um, only in the southern states, did not want black women to vote. Mm -hmm. So you have an ass assortment of very um, intelligent, well-funded, uh, politically savvy women who are working actively to oppose uh, first suffrage in the states and then the 19th Amendment. Yeah. I think a couple other sort of nuances to that, um, and Elaine did a really good job, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that there are sets of women who, who have an interest in mm -hmm. the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things about the sort of more well-heeled opposition to women's suffrage was not simply, although certainly, that, that they had power by proxy, but that they also had power by claim to being above politics, mm. right? So that they in yes. fact were uh, often quite public themselves, had very public careers, mm -hmm. and were not only operating in the home, but, but were operating in public space with, they thought, a very special claim to above politics, more, you know, that they were a moral voice. And that, and that by not having an electoral stake that they got a particular claim 
right, on, on the goodness, trueness um, of, of their causes. And so uh, there were certainly a set of women who were against suffrage for, for, for literally their own, you know, political reasons, for their own sense of where their power in politics came from, their own direct power, um, as well as their sort of power by proxy um, through, through, uh, through powerful men in kinship um, circles. Um, uh, yeah, and then there certainly was resistance that was tied to religious conviction, mm -hmm. right? There certainly was resistance that was tied to notions of what God had ordained um, and uh, you know, the upset to, to the order that God had ordained. Um, and so um, that's also very interesting that there are religious women who that's how they come to the suffrage movement, right? That's how they come to abolition, and then that's how they come to notions of of God ordaining every human with equal human dignity and taking that off in an equal rights um, direction. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a theme of, of, of a more conservative interpretation, mm -hmm. right, of, of a natural order ordained by God. Um, and, and so you do see that sort of resistance mm -hmm. um, as well. Right? There's also a business aspect, which you, you kind of touched on, which is um, that many of the leaders of the anti, the women's anti-suffrage movement. And it was um, centered in Boston and New York yes. for a long time. Then they open up a, a lobbying office in Washington. Um, but a lot of them are the wives or daughters or sisters of bankers or corporate executives. And another whole strain of male anti-suffrage um, uh, power was from corporate interests. Mm -hmm. And these were often, again, very wealthy men who had, you know, had power in the legislature, helped decide who was going to be running, who, who, the, who the political um, uh, players were going to be. And putting women in the mix was going to upset their power base. So they didn't want it. Um, then some of them were involved in industries that feared women at the ballot box. And again, we don't think about this. We don't think about women's suffrage being affected by economic forces, uh, political forces, wars. I mean, we think of it as like this little bubble that just bounces along <laughs> above everything, but it's not. It's buffeted by all of these things. And so uh, what I discovered were the industries that worked very hard to defeat both suffrage, you know, any time it came uh, up for a referendum, but also in the, in the ratification process and in, in passage of, in yeah. Congress. And these were the railroads who yeah. um, pretty much owned a lot of state legislatures and uh, did not want the status quo uh, messed up. And it was going to be expensive for them to have to bribe new, new legislators. Um, the manufacturers because they feared that if women could vote, they might want to abolish child labor. And these, these indus that industry depended on child labor. It was cheap and depended on cheap women's labor. So they didn't want women having any say in, in government. Um, and then, of course, the, the liquor industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it's, it's there's certainly some of these forces that we're afraid of, of the risk of what women might do. But, but I think it's also important to point out that, that the, the risk came before you sort of even got to that piece of the equation, which was that by the time we're talking about votes taking place in legislatures, the suffrage movements become aligned with other movements, right? And the suffrage movement has become aligned um, it, one of its strongest partners is, is the farmers' um, organizations. Um, but then a close second is, is labor, right? Organized labor is, is one of uh, women's suffrage's um, strongest advocates when they can keep that coalition together. And it's a fraught coalition um, because the women running the movement are not the working class women right, in the labor movement. Um, these are difficult to maintain 
uh, coalitions, but when, when they are brought together under the progressive umbrella, um, it's really a political force. And this, the, this is really a point at which you see right, the sort of really strong corporate backlash right, against the right. So women's suffrage is, is now a progressive cause. And, and in states and localities, it has moments way before the progressives where it, where it similarly becomes. It becomes, it's associated with a, a bunch of reform movements, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, in some ways, smart politics, right, to have a coalition, like I was saying earlier, that so women aren't, they aren't attractive as a like, well, let's enfranchise them because the women's vote will certainly favor this party versus another, right? There, there aren't politicians thinking that, right, this puts a lock on, on a particular um, person advantage, right? So, so you need coalition partners, but with partners come new enemies too, right? And this notion of, well, maybe, maybe there's something to fear from women's votes, but even if we can sort of allay that fear, well, you're working against us as is, right? Um, Let's talk a little bit about, we've been talking about the movement as a national movement, mm -hmm. but both of your books actually make the point in different ways, but you both make the, the point that this is actually state-driven, mm -hmm. this is lo locality-driven, yes. there might be different politics, different, um, uh, different power dynamics depending on, on uh, the particular state mm -hmm. and, and, and the, what's going on at the local level. So talk a little bit about how this works at the national level, but then you have these movements to gain state voting rights state by state, as well as the movement towards the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so this is a really important point that we, we like to say that the 19th Amendment guaranteed women the right to vote, and, and mm -hmm. I wish that that were true, right? But, but of course, none of us has an affirmative uh, constitutionally protected right to vote. We have constitutional protections against particular discriminations, right? Mm -hmm. And beyond that, the US Constitution reserves the right to determine the qualifications of electors to the states. Right, so this is why this is fundamentally a state-driven process, because at the end of the day, right, the Constitution defines the power to define the qualifications of electors as a state power. So states can always have, will continue for forever to have different qualifications for voters, right? So, um, and even now that we have the 19th Amendment, it protects me from being denied the right to vote literally because I'm a woman, right? but it doesn't prevent the, the state in which I live from adopting some other provision that could, that could take away my, my right to vote. So what were those uh, literacy tests, poll taxes, um, what, what other provisions were, were utilized in that way? Property qualifications, mm -hmm. right? Taxpayer status, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, literacy, mm -hmm. um, right? so we, we think now of citizenship as being a prerequisite. It hasn't always been. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the course of the time that uh, women are pushing for voting rights, non-citizens in some states have then again lose the right to vote. Um, it was common in, in quite a number of states for a time for um, there to be alien declarant, which is to say you were an immigrant, you declared an intention to become a citizen, and you could have the right to vote, right? So the idea of that, that over this time period, in fact, there are lots of ebbs and flows in mm -hmm. what the state, how states are defining who exactly is a voter and mm -hmm. who exactly is not. Now, the, the suffrage movement had to confront the dilemmas of federalism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, that's how it, uh, the states are in control of voting requirements. So the way the movement starts is, okay, we're going to move into every state um, or states that, that look possible, and we're going to try to change the state constitution. Because most of the state constitutions in the mid 19th century and then after the, even after the Civil War, many states uh, defined voters, eligible voters, as white men. And to change this took constitutional conventions in the states, state level, um, and, and changes. And so, 
the, the right to vote can be afforded either by your state, because it's in charge of, of its citizens and, and their um, ability to vote, or it could, that can be superseded by a federal amendment, which would uh, you know, over, override all state requirements. So the movement starts out as a state by state, you know, we're gonna, first it's Kansas, uh, and then it's um, you know, Colorado, and they, they go from state to state. Um, sometimes what will happen is the uh, state legislature uh, won't change the Constitution, but will say, well, okay, let's put it to a vote. Let's put it to the, a vote whether women should be able to vote here. So who can vote in these referenda? Men, only. Uh, and they, the suffragists wage dozens, dozens of these referendum campaigns. And they lose most of them because it's really difficult. Um, you had to convince men to give up their power. Uh, then you would have the corporate interests and money would, would flow into the campaign from the liquor industry or from whatever. And suddenly they, oh, and there was a lot of shenanigans and vote stealing and things. So they, they lost most of these. Um, and so it becomes apparent that this is not going to work or it's going to take forever. And so there's always a, a tension within the movement whether they should just keep going and get every state um, to adopt women's suffrage. There are a few successes. Today we're celebrating Wyoming, which um, in 1869, um, I think it was yesterday actually, mm -hmm. uh, as a territory adopts women's suffrage, uh, women's ability to, to serve on juries, which is kind of tied to that right to vote. I don't know why, but it is. Um, and, uh, and allowing them to run for office. So it opens up everything to women. Wyoming is still a territory. There's like six women there. Um, so it's only a slight exaggeration. There are about 20,000 people in the state, about 20% of whom are, are women. Right, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I stand corrected, but uh, there weren't so a lot of It's slightly people. more than six, but it's not a whole lot more. It's than not six. a whole lot more. And, and then, when, so they're not in a state yet. But when they do apply for statehood some years later, um, they want to allow women to vote because they've been voting in the territory. And Congress writes back and says, oh, no, we don't do that in the United States. Women don't vote. And the, ter the territorial governor, at least you know, I've, I have seen this, um, says, no, we would stay out of the union 100 years if we can't bring our women with us. And so Congress backs down, and Wyoming becomes the first state to allow women to vote. And then it is the Western states who would adopt uh, suffrage at the state level um, first. And it's Idaho and Nevada and uh, Utah and Colorado. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Colorado's the first state that adopts women's suffrage you know, by referendum. referendum. Right. Um, it's also the first populated state. It's the first state to add, um, add women's suffrage rather than come into the union uh, with women's suffrage already in its constitution, mm -hmm. which is you know, it's, that's, in other words, that's, it's more politically difficult. Mm -hmm. So Wyoming comes in in 1890, uh, the Colorado campaign is in 1893. Mm -hmm. At this point, I bring this up because this is a good point about this national versus state sort of understanding. At, at the point at which Colorado looks like it might be promising to the women in Colorado, the national organization is very committed to Kansas and has decided that Kansas is the only state that looks like it would be possible. Um, and so the women uh, on the ground, the Colorado women on the ground, are writing desperately to the national organization that has the resources, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, w it's promising here. Please come in and support a, a, a campaign. You know, we swear where it's more promising than Kansas. Um, and the response written back to them is, ha ha, you know, um, what do you know? <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating exchange, in part because the exchange is carried, th the, the person representing the national organization at that point is Carrie Chapman Catt, who will become the president. But here she is figuring out this politics 
um, um, very early on in the movement, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the, that, that campaign was, was a really a game changer for her as a, as a politician, as a political strategist. Um, and so she, she wrote, it's a, she's having an exchange with a, a, a local Colorado leader, so she's actually, Ellis Meredith, she's actually the daughter of the editor of, of the Rocky Mountain News, right, so the main paper. Um, and, and, you know, Meredith is like, come, please, come, this is promising. And it's promising because of our politics, and there are these populists, we don't know anything about populism these days, right? There are these populists, and there's this push for free silver, and there's lots of political unrest, and we have an in here, um, and, and, and the national's like, no, Kansas is where it's at. And so Meredith writes back this missive with like numbered points about how politics actually work <laughs> um, and, and, and why the national is so wrong about this. And, and Kath had written that, that the national's position was that you know, we've t we haven't talked with anyone who, has, you know, who thinks that there's any real chance here. The, the support is going to Kansas. And, and Meredith writes back, you say you talked to no one who knows, you know, thinks there's any support. Have you talked with anyone who actually knows anything about the state? Um, so, so they have this exchange, and, and it's finally convincing. And there's a whole cat going back to the national leadership, and there's a renegotiation, and yeah, we should maybe sign. And Cat actually becomes the, mm -hmm. the national's representative that gets sent out to Colorado. She, she travels the state. She, she gets up on stage and personally endorses free silver because it's, it's what the Colorado women tell her. Now, this isn't something that they're going to do in any other part of the country, right? But for the Colorado campaign, um, it's the thing to do. Why? Because it's the populist party that's going to help them get over this referendum hurdle. It's a populist party that is going to actually deliver not just the legislative votes, right, but is going to work the polls in a way that only men can do at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I think Colorado is a, a fascinating story for all of these pieces about mm -hmm. this national versus state, sort of what's at stake, how varied the conditions politically and otherwise can be, um, and, and how much this national leadership is actually fairly East Coast, right, leadership. I mean, Kat is from Iowa, but she's transplanted, you know, in terms of working with the national organization that's, that's Really and it cool. works. Right, um, and it works, right? And, and that's and, what they learn. And another, another national versus local and state issue, of course, is, is, is race, is, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and interacting at the, uh, uh, the national level, but definitely at the state and, and local level. And you really can't have, you can't have a substantive conversation mm -hmm. about the women's suffrage movement without talking about the role of race. So can you talk about uh, why race is so important um, in, in the fight for women's uh, uh, right to vote and how it becomes increasingly important uh, as they march towards the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So race um, is important at the very outset of the movement. When you think of it, the women's suffrage movement grows out of the abolition movement. Mm -hmm. It grows out of those ideas of divine rights of, of people, of, of the divine spark. And the women we think of as the foremothers of the suffrage movement, and even the men who were involved in the early part of, of the women's, women's suffrage movement, are, begin as abolitionists. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, they're all um, out there as, as um, campaigners for for abolition, and they risk their lives at that. I mean, there's incredible descriptions of uh, Lucretia Mott, you know, leading a group out of a burning building, which has been set afire uh, because they were having an abolition meeting. So um, these women are abolitionists, and the movements are uh, move in tandem through the Civil War. The women are working um, for emancipation. Uh, they're pushing. President Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. They, they uh, organized something called the, the uh, Loyal 
Loyal League, the, mm -hmm. the Union Loyal yeah, yeah, League, Loyal and League. it's the first national women's organization. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really kind of cutting their teeth on political organizing. And you know, one of the most moving moments that I discovered in researching my book is at Seneca Falls, it's Frederick Douglass who stands up, uh, who's there because he's been working with all these women in the abolition movement. It's not no coincidence that he's there. He's been invited. He stands up and he supports Sus um, Elizabeth, Susan Anthony's not even there. She's not part of the movement yet. Mm -hmm. But he supports uh, Elizabeth Stanton's call for enfranchisement. It was one of her uh, uh, resolutions, and it was considered outrageous. And most of the other, her other friends and, and colleagues said, withdraw that. That's going too far. Well, we can't ask it. for the vote. Yeah. And it's, it's actually Frederick Douglass who stands up and says, oh, yes, you must. You must fight for this vote, for the vote, because it's not going to be given to you. It's not going to give, be given to me. And we, all, we both have to fight for it. So the idea is that after the Civil War, there's going to be universal suffrage, that both black men, emancipated black men, black women, and white women, all the people who've been disenfranchised, most of the people who've been disenfranchised, will, would be able to vote. And so it's after, after when, in the, in the um, Reconstruction Amendments, in the 14th and 15th Amendments, when women are left out, um, and again, it's this, the powers, uh, those in power, pitted the two disenfranchised classes against each other and said, no, only one of you can, can we, can't, we can't handle, the nation can't handle two big reforms at once. So it's either going to be, you know, black men or, you know, we can't, we can't a attach having all women get the vote too. And this splits the coalition apart. And the women are, most of the women are very angry. Some of the suffragists actually uh, accept the idea that the 14th and 15th Amendments will, will not allow uh, women to be part of it. So the whole becomes fraught. It becomes fraught politically as it will be socially too because they are working in a completely segregated society. And so suffrage clubs are segregated for the most part in the North and the South. Um, and that tension of who is going to be represented by the movement, who's going to be included, whose voices are going to be heard, will continue to haunt the movement um, you know, to the end. But I think one of the racial aspects that I discovered and I think is really important to bring out is, yes, there's racism within the suffrage movement. Um, and there are certainly racist suffragists. But it's the anti-suffragists who really weaponize the concept of race and use that as a political cudgel to try to defeat uh, women's suffrage and the 19th Amendment. So it's the anti-suffragists who are accusing the suffragists of, of being too friendly to, the black, to black women and saying, is this what you want? Uh, so, so the suffragists were caught like in between. They are, they're being um, you know, honestly um, criticized by black women saying, you're not, you know, are you going to leave us behind? And then you have the, the white anti-suffragists saying, if you, if you allow these women, all women to vote, then black women are going to vote, and these suffragists are, are um, advocating that. So they're in this real bind, and it's race becomes a huge issue uh, as it comes down to, to ratification. Yeah, so I think it's important to realize that, uh, so women's suffrage as a, as a real proposal emerges in northern states in the 1840s. It doesn't emerge as a real issue um, in southern, any of the southern states uh, until after this, until after the Civil War. Um, and the era of Reconstruction and Redemption is what's sort of going to define mm -hmm. what the Southern movement is going to look like and the terms in which, the terms on which Southern women are going to advocate for the right to vote. And that, I think, is important to point out is, is also 
more fraught than is often presented. There, the idea that white supremacy is a, a on the surface political agenda is inescapable. Um, it's, nobody's hiding it. Nobody's talking in coded language about it, right? Um, this is very much um, overt politics of maintaining, reasserting, and then maintaining a, a, a white supremacist system, um, explicitly white supremacist system in the South uh, after redemption. So um, there are Southern suffragists who, uh, Southern women who become suffragists who embrace essentially that idea and begin to argue for for white women's voting rights very explicitly as white women's voting rights and attempt to push southern states to adopt their own white women's suffrage provisions to you know, negate the call for the national amendment, which might right, engender a, a different kind of, of, of voting oversight. Um, so there are definitely those, but but there are there are also in the South women who are um, committed to women's suffrage by any means, um, and uh, the the state of Louisiana is a great example of um, the Gordon sisters are there. They are on, they are on. They are uh, they are well resourced <laughs> women. They are on the side of the maintain the white supremacist order of things with women included. Um, uh, but there is also a, a more progressive-minded movement coming out of New Orleans, um, also white, white women, but, but white women who are willing to say, actually, we stand for women's rights no matter what, and we will advocate for a national amendment, or, or we'll do this the state way, either way, but, but we're, less, we're, we're like less worried about the racial order per se. So I think it's important to point out right, that there are the sort of general tendencies, and then there were people, you know, m making the general more complicated um, in lots of ways. Um, the Louisiana movement, in fact, will spend the tail end of, of, of the movement years with two separate state organizations uh, fighting each other and fighting for claim on which one should actually be the state's official uh, recognized uh, national affiliated organization. Yeah, I just want to uh, um, uh, elaborate on that too. That when it comes down to um, to ratification, you know, which is what my book is about, um, so it's finally passed Congress that the federal basically the suffragists realize that there are going to be some states, including Maryland, including Virginia, mm -hmm. which will never give women the vote because of the racial aspect, and so they say, okay. It's got to be a, a 19th amendment. It's not a 19th. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be a, a, a constitutional right. amendment, and um, it gets defeated in almost every, not quite every, um, uh, state of, of the old Confederacy. And the the reasons, I mean, there's complicated reasons. Each state's a little different, but basically, it's a state's <coughs> rights issue. So it's it's very much what um, we're talking about that. The idea that if states can make their own rules about who is eligible, then the states that want to can just say white women will vote. And that's in the, in the southern states, that's what they want. They want just white women shall vote. And a federal amendment is going to bring oversight from Washington and is going to say, oh no, all women are entitled to the vote. Now, it'll get subverted by Jim Crow laws, again, state laws that will undermine the 19th Amendment. But um, that's, that's the tension. The southern states are saying, no, we don't want Washington to be able to tell us who are eligible voters, who we allow in our ballot boxes. We'll hear that same argument in the mid 20th century in the civil rights movement, when the southern states will make the exact same argument and it's only the Voting Rights Act that will, that will uh, give some teeth to, to protecting it. And we're back there. We're back in that situation because we have states that are making discriminatory um, 
uh, voting restrictions on minority communities. So okay. it, it's, it's that still, that tension well, still and, there. And it's, it's not just an idea. We, so the Gordon sisters invent the, the proposal to push the southern states to adopt um, primary suffrage for women. At this point, the southern states have managed to exert the right to have primaries be whites only. So this is the this this is the actual innovation. The Texas and Oklahoma both adopt this. This is what the the southern the the Gordon sisters branch of the southern movement is. This is this is their invention, their policy proposal invention. They've actually got it adopted in a few of the southern states. So, so they actually do think that there's a realistic path to um, a state-level approach to enfranchising only white women. Um, and they think that they have it. And so what happens is at the very end, the Gordon sisters and their colleague, Laura Clay from Kentucky, who have spent their entire lives working for women's suffrage, come to Tennessee, the mm -hmm. last state to have to, uh, who, who will uh, put it over the top, but the last state, the last great battle, and they're working against ratification mm -hmm. of the 19th Amendment because right. they still want it only state-based. So last question before we go to the audience, and I know you probably have some questions. Um, today's Human Rights Day, mm -hmm. so we want to make this relevant also to today. A lot of women want to be involved in politics today in all kinds of different facets. What do you think women can learn from the women's suffrage movement? What can they learn uh, as the continuing for the fight for human rights and women's rights goes on globally in the United States? Persistence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that's one of the, the themes that, that really was so uh, impressive to me. These women were defeated time and time again at the state level, at the national level. Um, there were many more defeats than successes. They were humiliated, they were attacked, they were imprisoned, they were force fed, um, they were belittled, and they would brush themselves off, off and come back. And they had political strategies that sometimes didn't work and sometimes brought them to a, a dead end but they always came up with a strategy to, to go to the next level and to uh, figure out what went wrong. What went wrong in that state referendum? What went wrong in that uh, uh, lobbying campaign in Congress in that session? And so they used the political tools that they had gained and they became master politicians. They weren't just activists. I mean, they are activists and uh, you know, I'm wearing, and Colleen wearing our, our uh, jailhouse uh -huh. pin, which is uh, the symbol of the women who went to prison uh, for demanding, for, for picketing the White House. Uh, but even more importantly, they were lobbyists, they were campaigners, they were uh, political women, and they knew what they were doing, and they learned to use those tools. And, and I think that's something that today's activists um, uh, are learning or need to learn, and also that it's not you know, one demonstration and, okay, I've done it, went to that women's march. Um, it's, it's, it takes a lot of um, political strategy and political action, and it takes going back after failing, and I think that was something that, that I think must be uh, brought into the present. I think I have two, because mm -hmm. I'm a political scientist, and so I'll own that this, um, this is very much a, what a political scientist would say. One is that, you know, federalism, it's real. And so, <laughs> so, so is the real importance of, of, of local organizing. Now, the, the, we don't get this, we don't get the 19th Amendment without the women on the ground in right. states and cities who figured out what, what the national didn't know, um, who did the real grinding day-to-day -day work um, without ever thinking that you know, there was 
glory at the end of this, right? They, they, they weren't the ones being written up in the New York Times, infamously or not. Um, and they're not the ones we're building statues to, right? They were doing this for the sake of um, making their communities better. And, um, and they were leveraging their own local expertise and local organization mattered. My other one as a political scientist is that the other thing that really mattered were women coming to suffrage from other organized capacities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of our, all of our organization mm -hmm. can ultimately become a tool for politics, right? Um, women, women in the Grange, women in the Farmers Alliance pushed those organizations, the men of those organizations, to use their great lobbying power to push for women's suffrage. But women in labor um, organizations, labor unions, trade union leagues, pushed those organizations. So they came not just from formal suffrage um, associations, right? Much of the political clout that also made, made this happen came from outside of and then was hooked into, right? And so, you know, be involved, right? I, yeah. I think, you know, not underestimating the power of the involvement that you already have um, and the good work that you already do in your community and the ability to translate that always into something more by being a willing and to look for opportunities to work with others. Yeah, civic skills are transferable. They are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there must be some really great questions from our audience um, for our two experts here today. Sure. Oh, we have a microphone, I think, that's coming so that we can capture your question. Yeah, thank you. I just was interested in the Farmers Alliance groups and their move and their position in the right to vote. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, uh, uh, this is uh, it's something I document in my book is that this, in my opinion, is um, suffrage's um, greatest coalition partner. Um, uh, the farmers' organizations throughout both the Midwest and, and further west, um, and even at moments in the South. So we get lots of possibilities in the South, right? And, and they are from um, small farmers, right? And figuring out moments of ability to organize. Um, so many of these organizations started as fraternal organizations, right? Started as ways to keep people living in rural areas connected. And so they were co-ed from, from the get-go. Um, and these, so these farming organizations, the Grange, Farmers Alliance, were quite quick, actually, to integrate women into their organizational structures. Women eventually even become Grange masters um, in some of these states. And they, uh, their own women's membership pushes for those organizations who are mass, I mean, the farmer's lobby is politically incredibly powerful at that moment in American history, right? Um, and and it's women in, inside those organizations that can convince the organizations to commit, right? Convince, um, there's a story I tell in my book about uh, the Michigan, the, the case of Michigan, and the, the state range <laughs> comes in. So the Michigan legislature, the suffrage, suffrage working with partners, including um, uh, farmers organizations, um, have been working, and they've gotten really close um, and they have lots of friends in the legislature and all. The liquor industry is against them, right? Um, so, so they have friends, but they also have powerful foes. And they lose a really devastating, they have a really devastating legislative loss. They actually have a friend in the governor who's willing to call the legislature right back into session and say, try again, boys. And, um, and there's one thing that changes, and that is the state range decides that they are going to send upon the legislature. And so the, the Grange organization shows up at the state capitol. Um, the, the legislative chair in Michigan like, writes these really fascinating you know, recounts of, of exactly, like, I thought we were going to lose again, she's writing. To, like, but they showed up. 
And, and she's like, this is the list of, of legislators. They went in offices and converted them, and out they came, and, and we won. You know, we won the next time. So, so these, these sorts of coalitions, they, they, this is how you get met, right? This is how you get, you get these, these connections that you have forged in other spaces, right? Um, these, these other organizations that Elaine was talking about, well, you had to change culture. Well, like, there were organizations where, right, spaces in which that change culture was being worked out in a very organic way, right? Um, and these women were doing important work for those farmers' organizations. And they pushed, like, this is what we want in return. Yeah, I mean, the suffragists had to make, oh, we talk about intersectionality yeah. and uh, today, uh, but, the suffragists had to face because it's a long, long movement. And in that span, a lot of movements uh, and a lot of uh, historical moments happen that force the suffragists to either make alliances that will be helpful uh, or make alliances that seem organic. Um, and sometimes they then have to step back. Mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes they make strange bedfellows. So, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan actually um, supported suffrage in the South. Why? Because it would bring white women into, to, to bolster the white vote. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's a kind of weird thing that they're out there advocating for women's suffrage. Um, the uh, Carrie Chapman Cat makes the, the wrenching personal decision uh, as we enter World War I and, in the spring of 1917 to support uh, the war. She is personally a pacifist, uh, as is Jane Addams, as is several other suffrage leaders. But they say, no, this will get us, this will bring friends, this will impress Congress, this will uh, show that we're patriotic, that we're citizens, we deserve the, to, to vote. And so she even agrees to be on this, as does Anna Howard Shaw, this kind of sham women's committee um, that, that President Wilson creates as window dressing to see, see, you know, women are involved, and women were involved in the war, but um, it's something that personally was very distasteful to several of them, but they made that political calculation. They were going to become, support the war, and, and, and Carrie Catt writes a, a formal uh, letter to, to President Wilson that says, I. Um, offer the services of the two million women of the National American Suffrage Association. And it kills her to do it. And she, she spends the rest of her life atoning for it by working for peace uh, in, in several different organizations and founds several organizations for pacifists. But um, I, it's really fascinating to see uh, those kind of alliances uh, meet and sometimes split. Um, it's, you know, again, a, a lesson in political organization. Another question? I think I saw. Hi, good evening. Um, if you could choose um, one moment during the suffrage movement that made the ratification of the 19th Amendment politically viable, what would that moment be? Ooh. You can go back. <laughs> Made ratification politically viable. Um, I, I suppose I'd go back to. Um, I, I think, again, as political scientists, I, I, I think always about like who's who, who's pressuring votes, right? Um, And these these partnerships with so so we just talked about partnership with with farmers was fairly organic. Partnership with labor was far more difficult, and it gets a big boost under the Roosevelt run as a progressive candidate. So I think if there's an inflection point um, toward the toward the 19th Amendment. I'd probably place it there. Um, Roosevelt running as a progressive, he Theodore. endorses. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> TR. 
the first. <laughs> um, he endorses, right, he bolts from the Republicans. Um, he endorses um, women's suffrage. That causes both the major parties to address women's suffrage for the first time ever at their national conventions. So it's not until Roosevelt bolts on the Progressive Party ticket and upsets right, the political order that we get a willingness of the major party organizations to actually take this seriously. So that 1916 conventions is the first time the major parties ever address the uh, suffrage issue in a serious way um, and have both of them have planks in their 1916 conventions. So I would probably put it on that moment of the progressive bolting and part of what makes that work is how it upsets the partisan um, sort of status quo, and, they're, and and this is the idea that they're fighting over these farmer labor votes. Where are they going to end up? Um, I guess that uh, when it comes to the to the end game, to the ratification, uh, there are two major leaders. Uh, there's there's Carrie Chapman Cat, and there's Alice Paul, mm -hmm. who are working separately but towards the same goal of ratification. And they have to fight this in 48 states. They have to get, once it passes Congress, which again took 40 years, and it only passes in the Senate by two votes. So this idea that there was consensus, that there was a feeling, oh, the time has come, of course women, half of the nation deserves the vote, um, isn't true. It was still a slog. And in some states, it was very, some states, they, passed it unanimously, stood up, and sang Battle Hymn of the Republic. We, we, ha we know that. Um, and in some, it, it, it's fought to the, to the teeth. And Carrie Cat and Alice Paul are, are strategizing, mobilizing, sending crews, going out themselves, talking to the governors, talking to the legislatures. Um, so if there's... Um, you know, if, if you want to make it those leaders, but they're leading, um, you know, enormous uh, armies within the within the states. And I think one of the great um, uh, exciting things about celebrating the centennial, which we are about to do, is that it's bringing up all those names of women and men who fought at the local level. So states are beginning to really uh, delve into their own history and, um, and celebrate the women who are working at that level, who maybe have not been uh, talked about before. And researchers are doing that. And also looking for the other voices, which were not in the normal uh, historical uh, research spots. So the, the, the role of African-American suffragists has been really uh, not neglected because there's been wonderful scholarship about it, but it hasn't kind of per percolated to the public, and that's beginning to happen. The wonderful shall not be denied uh, uh, exhibit here, the one in the National Portrait Gallery, the one in the, the National Archives, are all beginning uh, at the national level to bring up some of those other voices of other participants. Uh, but also at the state level, it's happening, and at the local level. And that's really exciting, because there are so many uh, participants in this. It's not just Gary Cat and Alice Paul. Um, it's all those other women who devoted their lives to this and sent their nickels and you know went through the mud and snow knocking on doors. So that's an exciting part of celebrating this, I think. One last question. Uh, actually, I have two right here, so we, we can kind of keep them really succinct. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me what uh, role uh, Lucy Stone played in it and in which states? And um, also, whether or not people like Mother Jones and people like that that were down in um, places like West Virginia there. So Lucy Stone, and oh. then the question about if there were leaders in, in, in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there are leaders in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. I do not happen to know their names, but um, there are great histories um, that 
Uh, in fact, the, the sixth volume of the uh, National uh, American Women's Suffrage Association, History of Women's Suffrage, will, will give you some of those. But just go online and put West Virginia suffragists, and you'll get it. Actually, on, on our commission website, we have the state-by-state state, uh, chronicling. So we, yeah. we would have that on there. We have state kits for every state that will explain the leaders in the state. Um, there's a great women's history initiative uh, that's, that we're supporting where we're going to be erecting three or four uh, memorials in every state chronicling um, the fight for women's suffrage, either at the state levels or at the, or at the national involvement. So there's, yeah, I agree. There's, there's lots. Of, and, and as far as Lucy Stone, she's based in Boston um, and is, you know, very, she's, she leads uh, a, a schism within the movement in uh, 1870, 1868 and founds the American Women's Suffrage Association. And they, are, um, they have slightly different ideas of, of how to pursue uh, getting suffrage for all, all American women. The two uh, groups finally, so, so they're separated for a generation. And they, they finally come back together in uh, 1890. And so that's why it's the National American, American Women's Suffrage, Suffrage Association. Association. It's, it's the combination. And she's certainly a, a great force. In so what I love about Lucy Stone is that it's Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. It's a family affair, and it's the the and their letters to each other and referencing each other are are just a portrait in a, 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 a like a marriage built on political conviction, and um, and it's amazing to me to. Um, it's amazing to me how, how much Library of Congress, the, the Library of Congress, you know, is responsible for, for preserving so many of the, of the documents, including much of their, many pieces of their correspondence. Um, and, and Blackwell and Stone are really a team. They're very, um, they have very complementary skills. Blackwell is a, um, is sort of a, 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 among the first to be articulating in private correspondence this idea of like, well, how are we going to get, he's articulating this like conundrum, the, so you need parties to think this is a good idea, but we can't promise them votes, so, but we have to solve this problem. And it's really interesting to sort of see this go round between them. Um, so that, this is one of the things about, for, for many of these other women, it wasn't necessarily a family affair, right? It was a sort of, it, Anthony is, not ever married. Kitty Stanton is sort of gets a chance to go off, and then eventually, you know, is, is sort of she's at home, and and Anthony is doing the more public work. And um, but but what I love about the stone about the stone is that it's it's a family affair, and it involves well, so their children more, eventually. Yeah, we have one more question here. Mm -hmm. Those letters one have more. been digitized. Right here. Yes, yes. Right here. yes. Right here. that's what I'm saying. The, right the library kind of says that. Right. Thank you. I was just wondering. Um, did the women's suffrage movement in the U.S. have any impact on suffrage movements around the globe? Oh, yes. Um, we should, or I think I would uh, put that another way. Do the suffrage movements <laughs> around the globe have uh, an effect on America? Because we're the only, I think, the 27th nation to grant the women citizens the vote. We're very behind. Um, there's a big push after World War I uh, but I think New Zealand is the first, uh, uh, almost 50 years before America. So we were not in the vanguard in any way. Uh, someone like Carrie Chapman Catt and Jane Addams are um, leaders of the International Women's Suffrage Association, which is uh, Catt and, and Susan Anthony was involved in, in forming this with the British leaders. Um, and it's, it's international. This is an international movement. And they meet every few years, uh, usually in a European capital, and they, uh, they trade what's working. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you do that? And they bolster each other, and they, um, they have this sense of sisterhood. And so it's a very international movement. This is a British idea. Yes, this is a British this idea. This is a British idea. That, that uh, mm -hmm. Alice Paul learns mm -hmm. from uh, participating in protests in, in Great Britain and brings the idea of these sort of medal, medals of honor uh, if you've been in prison. And so this is actually uh, Hollowell Prison. Uh, this is the door of Hollowell Prison in London. 
but the it's used the here. The white is also an international symbol too. It's also very interesting because you watch, can watch the sort of the pageantry, the symbolism. You can also see travel across international mm -hmm. borders too. And so the wearing of white at suffrage demonstrations becomes an international pattern as well. Mm -hmm. And the so colors, you know, the green and the, the purple and the yellow, it, it, it goes, it has slightly different meanings in, in Great Britain. Uh, there's this beautiful picture of a 1917 suffrage referendum parade in New York uh, because they're about to vote on it, on a woman in full kimono. She's a Japanese representative. And they were pushing really hard uh, for the vote, but they don't get it actually until after World War II. Please join me in thanking Corrine and Elaine for a wonderful discussion this evening. And thank you to the Law Library also for sponsoring this. Thank you. Thank you.